So I'll dive in quickly and give a, mostly a historic overview of the uh, nomenclature and classification of uh, uh, thoracolumbar uh, spine uh, fractures. And I have no disclosures. And literally, this is a uh, junction that is most injured in the spinal column. Uh, it's about 5,000 neurological deficits per year, but there are about 20 to 25 cases of all traumatic fractures in young adults. And uh, the uh, fractures of the T1, T10 are uh, much less common. Um, but if you look at the uh, thoracolumbar spine, it's the most injured uh, because of the transition zone from the uh, lumbar uh, back by the th uh, kyphotic thoracic region to the uh, uh, lordotic lumbar spine. And, and so there, there's a lot of uh, rotational and shear forces during high energy. Um, but the real goal is um, how do we um, how do we prevent these stresses from um, happening or leading to more deformity after a spine fracture with or without neurological deficit? And most of this uh, injuries to these, uh, this area is from indirect injury and the loading rate is critical to, uh, is a critical determinant of the uh, uh, severity of the injury. But the radiographic studies don't always tell the, all the, uh, don't always give, give us the, um, sort of the level of injury, it's not always seen by the radiographic uh, imaging. So it's really important that we start looking at classification systems that also involve uh, neurological deficit, that also involve uh, wider communication. And you can see the involvement of the, of the classification uh, systems, uh, in, including uh, neurological deficit, including other factors that we get um, more savvy as, as uh, uh, experimentation and also as uh, our knowledge increases. There's really no agreed classification of uh, thoracolumbar fractures right now, as we all know, but ideally it should be a simple system. It should be something that behind the back of a card you can easily uh, educate your advanced practice providers, uh, residents, um, and also even have an easier communication with colleagues as to what to do and, 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 and how to go from there. So um, in order not to belabor the point, it's also you should include a vast majority of injuries, uh, reflect the mechanism of injury, and also correspond to anatomic pathology that's agreed upon, and make it easier to determine treatment options and also determine prognosis. So in, in the past, um, and even still currently, it's still everything seems to revert back to the three column injury, uh, three column model, which is the anterior, middle, and posterior column that we're all familiar with where the anterior column typically is involved in compression fractures, where the ligament is intact, the canal is intact, and then to the point where you get a stable burst fracture. This is all the um, past way in which we identify direct lumbar fractures and still do. Um, typically, people you know, call, call one of my colleagues and revert to some of the newer classification system and say, so what really, is this a stable burst? And I said, yeah, yes it is, but I'm just trying to boil it down to some grades for you. But you have a stable burst fracture, that meaning there's neuro intact uh, for the patient, there's loss of canal height, the angulation, and also there's communication of the anterior column to the unstable burst fracture where there's spinal cord injury, to worse and worse uh, levels where you have a flexion distraction injury, chance fracture, um, the posterior ligament disruption, and also fracture dislocation, which uh, seems to involve the uh, most uh, severe global instability of the spine. As time moved on, um, the AO classification uh, became widely used, and, uh, um, and this started in 1994 based on 1,400 plus cases. And basically, it's three major groups, the uh, compression, distraction, and also rotational or resistant of torsion. The newer 2013 classification refers to C group as displacement and not just resistant of torsion. But literally, they were broken down into three and also three other subgroups till at the point it became an exercise in frustration, um, trying to tell some of my, we, we thought we were very cute when we were uh, residents when we decided to adopt the AO classification until when you call somebody at 3M and you tell them that they have a, a uh, a, uh, they have a, a B, uh, what, a one, three, and, and they start screaming at you to be more specific, and you're like, so what's the purpose? Um, but eventually, it became more clinically oriented. Um, it, we 
came out with the uh, in 2005 the uh, thoracic lumbar injury classification and uh, severity uh, scale or TLIC scale, which also had a three part description, including the injury morphology, integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, and also the neurological status of the patient. And it sort of had a nice flow algorithm, less descriptive of of the uh, uh, fracture, but also, also taking in totality a point system where you start with the injury morphology and you, you say, is it a translational injury with rotation? They have a three score. If they have a compression fracture with axial flexion or it's a one, add one for a burst fracture. And if there's a distraction injury, add four. And then you look at the uh, posterior ligamentous complex, which can be examined by MRI, CT, or even plain films where you go on and say if it's intact, it's zero. If you suspect it, you know, two. If it's injured, three. So you add that all, and then you have the neuro neurology point system. And this seems to be um, widely used now. Um, there are qualifiers, and I say this is where I live in the in the in the uh, clinical qualifiers. You know, you, you have a great scoring system, but you really live here. Do they have overlying burns? Do they have the inability to be braced due to other uh, issues? Are the chest tubes coming out? Or is this not going to work? Um, or do you have uh, rheumatologic disease um, and other uh, skeletal uh, uh, metabolic bone disease that require you to uh, change whatever classification system you're using? And the last one would be if they have multiple trauma, um, severe close head injury, um, I'm not taken to the operating room until we, we know for sure that they're going to make it from the other injuries. What you end up with is you have a three, you have a scoring system where th three points or less. You with that, and also going through your qualifiers, you think about the fact of a non-operative um, scenario, and then if you have four points, it's sort of surgeon's call, and, and five points or more, it leans more to a surgery. Like I always say, it's always the qualifiers, the clinical qualifiers that matter, and not necessarily the scoring system. I use this as a way of communicating amongst providers, making sure that. Everybody's on the same page. And it's also good to document um, for also legal reasons, sort of your criteria for, for surgical uh, intervention, et cetera, or non-surgical intervention, because it's always the non-operative, failed non-operative person that gives you the most headaches uh, in, 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 in my region. Um, and I always have this nice card that's printed out for any new advanced practice provider. I said, look, this is what I will, I'll have. And you, will, you can just go through it. Give me a uh, give me a phone call. We'll go through it, and you can always start with morphology, integrity of the posterior longitudinal uh, complex, neurological statics, and we can predict need for surgery. And you can give me more information. So you can apply this to a 35-year-old male who fell from a, a scaffold ladder. He has a burst fracture. He's neurologically intact. His posterior longitudinal limits intact, even though he has some canal compromise from the CT. Um, you can also say, okay, what, what are we going to do? He's got a score. Um, if you apply to case two, if he's intact, he's non-operative. Case two, he's got neurology, he's got complete injury, uh, PLL is disrupted, he's got seven points, he needs to be realigned um, and decompressed if, if necessary. The, the TLIC score has been validated nicely, um, but there are critiques of it. They're saying that the surgeon bias is all leading to surgery, too much leading to surgery, and it's all made up from small group biases, and there's lack of evidence-based medicine. Um, I always say in surgery, evidence-based medicine, the best evidence-based medicine may not meet criteria for, uh, may meet criteria as to um, deciding what kind of uh, cholesterol pill you may, you may want to take. It, we, we just can't get there. We can't be blinded enough. So, I like this system because it's easy to teach trainees. It's simple. It considers most of the important decision points. And if they, at the back of the card, if they have the clinical qualifiers, you can actually have a meaningful discussion. Um, and since 2013, the AO actually started embracing some of these uh, systems. So now we have sort of two cards. You can pick one. I think it works best. You can always revert back if you're talking to your colleagues. Um, to the three-column injury model to simplify things. But if you really want to have a logical discussion and rationale for surgical intervention, you can always pick cards because now the AO also has ligamentous disruption identified and not just, dis uh, uh, and not just displacement in B. So 
basically you have to just familiarize yourself with the classification system. Um, the surgical approach may be based on other factors such as the patient related issues and also the surgical preference. The best surgery is the safest surgery in your hands. And your treatment goal really is to prevent further neurological deterioration, stabilize the spine, and you want to restore the anatomical alignment, um, facilitate early and active mobilization, and of course, pain and deformity. So options, and really it, it boils down to compression fractures, brace, vertebroplasty, uh, vertebro calcoplasty um, versus uh, uh, just allowing the patient to recover on your own, stable burst, brace for the majority. My obese patients typically have a healthy discussion as to whether they're going to be compliant. Um, and also for the unstable burst, we have to consider front, back, anterior, posterior surgeries and chance fractures or those with uh, um, metabolic bone disease, I highly consider um, avoiding brace unless they are really frail. Okay, so only a certain amount of immobilization can be tolerated, in, in particularly in frail and morbidly obese or people with multi-system injuries. So I always have to say intervene early and stick with the plan. Um, if there's going to be bracing, let's start early. Um, if they're going to be operated on, let's intervene before tissues become too swollen and also the effects of your trauma uh, takes over and, and it becomes a nightmare on post-trauma day three, trying to operate on somebody who's now in lactic acidosis, et cetera, pulmonary compromise, et cetera. So there have been several studies comparing anterior posterior surgery for thoracolumbar burst fractures, and it keeps going on and on. I thought did everything that needed to be uh, studied from whether front, back, long, short was done in 2006, but 2016, it's just, you know, every month there's something about somebody's uh, discussion as to what is best. But I really think it boils down to bone quality and also uh, bone quality and extension of it is age and extension of it is the degree of injury. Um, you may require anterior column support just to um, maintain the patient's balance and alignment, particularly those with partial neurological injury where their possibility of improved scores and improved uh, function it's high, okay? So typically I have these little pearls, I wouldn't say rules because they were made before I even started training, which is people with ankylosing spondylitis, DISH, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, those with severe malnourish. Um, basically I like to go with posterior augmentation for them, okay? We'll skip this uh, in terms of time. Um, but uh, typically with advances in, in, in techniques uh, and lateral as access, it used to be you had a wide open uh, uh, lateral access surgeon to, to get you there. These days, um, particularly with my group in Pittsburgh uh, sometimes, uh, but you can get a lateral access uh, with minimal distraction and actually with expandable cages, uh, perform the same surgery that uh, with less, um, with less morbidity, less length of stay for the patient. Um, however, uh, this, this always requires optimal time. If you come in at 10 a.m., it's great. If it's a, a 11 p.m. case, we're not possibly, probably not going to have lateral access. It's just a matter of where you are and, and what you have access to. Can this wait till the following morning? You bet if this is uh, your approach. I just want everybody to try to deviate from what they typically do every day in the lab and to go see other things and, and to see how easy it is to extrapolate your practice pattern to something new and, and much more uh, beneficial uh, for the patient with less, uh, with less mor morbidity. So really, every time I give this talk, it's always, when do I brace? When do I go to surgery? Um, I tell people that I've had more problems going the non-op route um, without considering things that may not necessarily uh, be polite. Um, basically, you want to know how compliant a patient is going to be. Um, the worst problem I had was um, insisting that somebody was mentally, um, had a lot of mental issues and not so compliant, but his fracture pattern fit um, a non-operative 
issue, and then subsequently he wasn't complying the brace and developed a spinal cord uh, injury. Um, and, and the questions were, how do I extrapolate the fact that he's not going to be com a compliant mental patient, though he was living independently, and everybody so I said, you're never going to win in this game. The, op the converse nature would be an errant stabilization screw saying, did I treat him differently because of his uh, ongoing mental disorder? So you, you never win, but I always say you have to consider these factors, age and also body habitus. Is this person, is the, is the custom uh, TLSO brace even customized enough due to their body habitus? Are they even um, being supported by it? And also the circumstance of the accident. If it's a really devastating um, uh, accident, I really feel that I, I should be very cautious about putting somebody in a non-operative uh, uh, scenario. It's much easier that these days when you look at some of the studies coming out, they talk about it's not very clear what to do when somebody's neuro intact and they have quite a devastating fracture. Brace seems to be winning these days, but I always say it's always the patient caveats. Um, I wouldn't brace anybody who I know is not going to be compliant. It may seem there, but I can't imagine how many times I failed to heed my own advice. Um, some of the goals of percutaneous fixation, um, which is on the rise, uh, uh, the I think it's a it's a great thing. Um, it's a great skill to have uh, percutaneous fixation. But I always say the best surgery is the safest surgery in your hands. Um, there are wonderful goals that can be achieved with just percutaneous, but their learning curve and the loss of tactile feel, and also some people. In the last five years, the ability to compress and distract um, with some of these uh, implants uh, has gone really um, over over what used to be a limitation to now to be the best uh, possibilities in, in terms of uh, percutaneous. So I always urge people to, to try to think about percutaneous fixation and to spend the time developing the workflow, uh, if I can use that term, since Pat's out of the room. Um, the it, it's really vital if you have a distraction injury sort of this to to try to percutaneous approach um, to avoid packing nerve roots which used to be a, a fun job of mine as a fellow um, with our atv accidents in in uh, southwest virginia but literally i just want to conclude and i know this is a brief overview of cme portion to say there are no major changes the classification system are there for you to communicate with uh, providers um, and e ease uh, transfer. And um, basically, you just have to have a good trauma service and decide on a plan and do it before post-trauma day three, if you can. Thank you. <laughs>